Do you guys ever get the feeling that you're about to make a huge mistake? Yeah, me neither. Welcome back to part two of CEDH Tribals. So it's been a while since we've made a video and we thought what better way to come back than by remaking our most talked about video ever, CEDH Tribals. This time we're going to do it a little bit differently and actually tell you what we mean when we say CEDH Tribals because that seemed to be something that people didn't like. So rule number one, I am not allowed to play. You are welcome. Rule number two, at least 25% of your non-land cards need to be part of your tribe. Well, like 25%-ish. I didn't really count everyone's deck because, well, I'm not a nerd. Rule number three, anything in your command zone must be part of your tribe. It's kind of redundant with rule number one, but you know, we might as well throw it in there. Uh, rule number four, the main win con of each deck needs to directly involve your tribe. Now we're a little bit loose with this explanation. You're allowed to like pump up your board if you're playing elves and swing with a bunch of pumped up elves, but we're not allowing stuff that's like, let's say a human tribal and you have a sack outlet that's a vampire and a pinger that's a vampire. That's not a human tribal win con because the humans are just fodder at that point. So that's kind of our main distinction. If you don't like that, feel free to leave an essay in the comments and like argue about it down there because I'll be honest, we haven't made a video in a year and a half and we can really use those interactions. And rule number five, this one's for you actually. If you end up liking the video, feel free to like the video. And if you haven't already, subscribe, please. We're very desperate. It's been many months since we've uploaded and YouTube doesn't like that. So please help us out just a little bit. Uh, and if you end up really liking the video and want to see a whole other game of this pod, check out our website where you have like a little membership system set up. Very similar, pretty much exactly like Patreon, just on our own website where you can get exclusive content and early access to all of our videos. Check out that website if you're interested. Anyway, with the rules out of the way, let's introduce our players. How's it going? I'm Bill and today I'm playing Timna Ludovic Human Tribal. I modeled the deck after Opus Thief utilizing wheels for value, but is much less optimal having 20 plus humans. The main win condition is Abdel, the Human World Gorger Dragon, and animate dead effects to make infinite creatures and infinite mana. Or I can use Brain Freeze lines as a backup. Hey guys, this is Nate from Casual Competitive. Today I'm going to be playing Varina Lich Queen. Uh, the goal of this deck is to use a recursive zombie like Gravecrawler, a pinging zombie like Corpse Knight, and a free effect like uh, Rooftop Storm or Phyrexian Altar. The commander itself allows me to loot through a bunch of cards for card selection, and if all else fails, try and get through through combat damage. Hi, my name is Adam. Today I'll be playing Lathral Blade of the Elves. This is a combat damage and aristocrats based elf deck that uses elf lords and combat tricks to do a lot of damage with the commander to make a ton of tokens and overwhelm the board while also using aristocrat effects like the Meat Hook Massacre and Poison Tip Archer to drain people out through killing your own tokens through combat damage or sacrifice. Hey, I'm Nate and I'm playing Cranko Mob Boss. The theme of this deck is Goblin Tribal, and the goal is to win through combat damage via goblins, ETB effects triggered by those goblins, in combination with something like Impact Tremors or Perforos God of the Forge, or from a few infinite damage loops such as Kiki Jiki and Lightning Crafter. Bill starts off this first game back by playing a Plains, casting a Lotus Petal, and he then decided to show everyone that he came to throw hands, so he casts a turn 1 Sarah Ascendant, follows that up by a Lion's Eye Diamond, before passing the turn to Nate B. Nate casts a Mana Crypt, taps it to cast a Fell War Stone, he then plays a Swamp, and then uses his mana to cast a Corpse Knight. With nothing else, he passes to Adam. Adam plays a Yavamaya Cradle of Growth as his land, and then he casts a Utopia Sprawl, naming Black. He then shifts the turn to Nate L. Nate plays a Crystal Vein as his land, and then casts a Mana Vault before passing the turn. Bill plays a Command Tower, and then starts off this Tribal Beatdown by swinging his 6-6 Flying Lifelinker that he always somehow seems to have on turn 1 at Adam. Adam takes the damage and Bill then passes to Nate B. Nate loses his Mana Crypt trigger, plays a Godless Shrine as his land for turn, losing two life to shock it in, and he then attempts to cast Varina Lich Queen. In response to this, Bill really solidifies his place as the least liked person in this game so far by casting a Mana Drain, countering Nate's commander. Nate then casts a Mana Vault for one mana and goes to the combat and swings his Corpse Knight at Bill. Bill takes the damage and Nate passes to Adam. 
Adam plays a Swamp and then casts a Priest of Titania. He follows this up by casting a Heritage Druid and, with nothing left to do, passes to Nate L. Nate on his turn plays an Inventor's Fair as his land and apparently didn't get the memo that he's playing colors in his deck and decides to just pass to Bill. Bill gets 4 colorless mana for Mana Drain on his turn. He then plays an Island and uses this mana to help cast Timna. He then uses more of this colorless mana to help cast Gale Waterdeep Prodigy, and he then goes to combat and swings his 6 6 Lifelinker at Adam, who of course takes the damage. Bill then pays one life to draw one card from the Timna trigger and then passes to Nate B. Nate wins his Mana Crypt trigger and then attempts to recast Verena Lich Queen. This time, it actually hits the battlefield and Corpse Knight triggers, dealing one damage to each of his opponents. He then goes to combat and swings his Corpse Knight at Nate L. On attacks, Verena triggers and Nate draws a card, gains a life, and discards a card, which is a Gravecrawler, and Nate L then takes the two damage. In his second main phase, he plays a tapped Bajuka Bog for his land for turn, targeting Bill to exile his graveyard, and with nothing left, he ships the turn over to Adam. Adam casts a Fauna Shaman on his turn and then taps Priest Titania to help cast an Elvish Archdruid. He then uses Elvish Archdruid's ability to help generate enough mana to cast his commander, Lathral Blade of the Elves, and then with nothing left, he passes to Nate L. Nate untaps, draws, and finally plays a Prismatic Vista as his land for turn, cracking it for one life to get a mount into the battlefield. He then casts a Dockside Extortionist from his hand, and when it enters the battlefield, he generates five treasures. He then uses some of these treasures to help cast his commander, Cranko Mob Boss. He then casts a Goblin Sharpshooter, and I'm now realizing why he kept an opening hand with no colored mana. With a threat now established, he passes the turn to Bill. Bill untaps and immediately goes to combat, swinging his 6-6 Flying Lifelinker at Nate. Once the damage is dealt in his second main phase, he pays one life to draw a card, and he then casts an Esper Sentinel. He then follows that up by casting a Diabolic Intent, immediately sacrificing the Esper Sentinel to tutor up a card to its hand. With nothing left, he passes the turn to Nate B. Nate takes one damage from his Mana Vault being tapped and also loses his Mana Crypt trigger. He then goes to combat and swings his Commander at Adam and his Corpse Knight at Bill. On the attack trigger, he draws two cards, gains two life, and discards two cards. Bill decides to block the 2-2 with his 1-3 and Adam just tanks the damage. In his second main phase, Nate plays a Fabled Passage and then immediately cracks it to get an untapped Swamp to the battlefield. He then plays Gravecrawler from his Graveyard, and when it enters the battlefield, it drains the table for one. He then casts Feed the Swarm, targeting Krenko. It resolves, Krenko gets destroyed, and Nate takes four damage. With nothing left, he passes to Adam. Adam goes to his turn and realizes that he's not really in a very safe place right now, so he decides to make some moves. He generates 10 mana between Priest of Titania and Elvis Archdruid, and uses this to, first off, activate Fauna Shaman, discarding a poison-tipped archer. He tutors up a Crater of Hoof Behemoth to his hand, and then uses his floating mana to cast it. When it enters the battlefield, it gives all of its creatures plus 6, plus 6, and trample until the end of his turn. He then casts Invigorate, giving Nate L 3 life instead of paying the mana cost, targeting his commander. He then swings a total of 32 damage at Bill. Bill declares no blockers, goes below the life total, so Sarah Ascendant is finally offline, and Adam generates 13 2 2 elf tokens from Lathrell's attacks. In his second main phase, Adam taps three of his new elf tokens with Heritage Druid's ability to generate enough mana to cast Herald Unites the Elves. The saga enters the battlefield, and the first part of the saga triggers, and he puts a poison tipped archer onto the battlefield. With the elf ball finally starting to get rolling, he passes the turn to Nate L. Nate takes a damage from his Mana Vault, but also gains a life from Adventure's Fair. Feeling he's done enough with his turn, he passes the turn to Bill. Bill immediately goes to combat, swinging his Timna at Nate B. No blockers are declared, and in his second main phase, Bill takes a damage to draw a card. He then casts a Wheel of Fortune. Now, in response to this Wheel of Fortune, Nate B casts Void Rend, targeting the Poison Tipped Archer, knowing that that's going to get out of control. In response to this, Adam casts Heroic Intervention, attempting to save his Elven Threat. In response to Heroic Intervention, Nate L, knowing his hand is going to go away and that Poison Tipped Archer is fairly dangerous, decides to cast Reiterate, targeting Void Rend to retarget the Poison Tipped Archer. He then holds priority on this cast and taps his Goblin Sharpshooter to ping Elvish Archdruid for one damage. The reiterated Void Rend then resolves, Poison Tipped Archer is destroyed, and Goblin Sharpshooter is then untapped. Nate L then retaps Goblin Sharpshooter to deal another damage to Elvish Archdruid. 
the Archdruid then dies, again untapping the Goblin Sharpshooter and removing the Blanket plus one plus one from the Elves. Now, remember, this is still in response to the heroic intervention. So Adam's creatures aren't indestructible, but they also no longer have that plus one plus one. So Nate L is basically able to just tap Goblin Sharpshooter and machine gun down all of these 1-1 elves, basically clearing Adam's board. Once the elves are taken care of, Nate L uses his Goblin Sharpshooter to take care of Gravecrawler and the newly 1-1 Sarah Ascendant. And then Wheel of Fortune finally resolves. Bill then completes his turn by playing a Cavern of Souls and to everyone's chagrin does not name merfolks with this, which is kind of weird considering, well, anyway, he names humans and then passes the turn. Nate B on his turn takes damage from Mana Vault but wins his Mana Crypt trigger. He then immediately goes to combat and swings his 4-4 Varina at Nate and the Corpse Knight at Adam. Varina triggers and Nate draws 2, gains 2 life, and then discards 2. No blockers are declared, the damage is dealt, Nate then plays a Morphic Pool as his land and for 1 mana casts a Soul Ring. He then decides to cast a Knight's Whisper, taking 2 damage to draw 2 cards, and he then casts a Talisman of Dominance. He follows that up by casting a Wayward Servant, dealing 1 damage to the table with Corpse Knight, and he then casts Gravecrawler from his graveyard, and when that enters the battlefield, it basically deals 2 damage to everyone and heals him for 1. He then goes to pass the turn to Adam, and on Nate's end step, Adam casts a Noxious Revival, targeting Elvish Archdruid, taking 2 damage for the mana cost. Nate B decides he's had enough of the elves and casts a swan song to give Adam a swan instead. Adam then goes to his turn and his saga triggers, giving all of his elves plus one plus one counters. He then plays a swamp as his land and then casts an elder fang venom. He goes to combat and decides to swing a total of 10 damage at Nate B. The damage is dealt, Adam creates three 1-1 elves from his commander's trigger, and with nothing left, he passes the turn. Nate L takes damage from Mana Vault, but also heals from the Inventor's Fair. He plays a Snow-Covered Mountain as his land for turn, casts a Mox Opal for zero mana, and decides he hasn't had enough destruction for this game, so he casts a by force X equaling 5. He targets Bill's Lion's Eye Diamond, Nate's Soul Ring, Mana Crypt, Fell War Stone, and Talisman of Dominance. Before Biforce resolves, Nate B uses some of this mana to activate his commander in order to create a zombie and drain the table. The Biforce then resolves, the artifacts are destroyed, and Nate L with nothing left passes to Bill. On his turn, Bill casts a Mana Crypt for 0 mana, and then for 1 mana casts a Mystic Remora. He then goes to combat, swinging Timna and Gale at Nate L. Nate L blocks the Waterdeep Prodigy, but takes the Timna damage. In his second main phase, Bill pays one life to draw one card, and then casts a Talisman of Progress. He then casts a Savine's Reclamation, targeting his Lion's Eye Diamond in his graveyard. It resolves, he gets the Lion's Eye Diamond back, but he doesn't have another card to trigger with his Gale Waterdeep Prodigy, so nothing happens from that. With nothing left, Bill passes to Nate B. Nate takes the damage from his Mana Vault and then immediately goes to combat, swinging a 4-4 at Nate, two 2-2s two at Bill, and a 2-1 Gravecrawler at Adam. On attacks, Verena triggers and Nate draws 4, gains 4 life, and discards 4 cards. And for blockers, Nate L decides to chump Verena with his Dockside Extortionist. The rest of the damage goes through, and in his second main phase, Nate casts a Dark Ritual. He then follows that up by casting a Headless Rider and then an Undead Augur, draining the table on each of these casts. With nothing left, he goes to pass the turn to Adam, and on Nate's end step, Nate L activates his Goblish Sharpshooter, targeting Headless Rider. It dies, Nate B creates a 2-2 zombie, and then loses one life and draws from the Undead Augur trigger. Adam then finally goes to his turn, and the final step of his Saga triggers. He then goes to combat and swings his available creatures at Nate. Due to the Saga Trigger, which allows him to put negative one, negative one counters on enemy creatures for each creature that Adam attacks with, Adam decides to give Undead Augur, Wayward Servant, Corpse Knight, and both 2-2 Zombies negative one, negative one until the end of turn. Nate B then declares his blockers. Combat damage is then dealt. Nate B takes seven total damage from the attacks and three of his Zombies die, allowing him to draw three cards and take three damage from Undead Augur. From each of these creatures dying, Nate L responds and taps his Goblin Sharpshooter to deal 1 damage to Adam's commander. 4 total things die, so Nate L is able to deal 4 total damage to it, leaving it untapped and killing Adam's commander. From Adam's 2 creatures dying, Adam is able to drain the table for 2 from Elder Fang Venom, and then finally, his commander's trigger, which went on the stack because it was alive when it dealt combat damage, gives Adam 3 1 1 Ls. Adam then goes to his second main phase and casts an Elvish Visionary, a Boreal Druid, and a Wirewood Symbiote. 
He then goes to pass the turn to Nate L, and on Adam's end step, Nate L taps his Goblin Sharpshooter to deal one damage to Wayward Servant, since it still has the negative one, negative one on it from Adam's Saga. And in response to this, Nate B pays two mana to make a zombie with Verena in order to drain the table before Wayward Servant leaves. Wayward Servant then dies, Goblin Sharpshooter is untapped, and then retapped to kill Corpse Knight, and he then kills Gravecrawler and Wirewood Symbiote. In response to the targeting of Wirewood Symbiote, Adam activates Wirewood, bouncing Elvish Visionary to his hand, and untaps Crater Hoof Behemoth, and then Wirewood Symbiote dies, and the turn is finally passed to Nate L. Nate L takes the damage from Mana Vault, plays a Snow Covered Mountain, and then sacrifices his Crystal Vein in order to cast Krenko for 6. He then passes the turn to Bill. Bill untaps and then rolls for his Mana Crypt Trigger, unfortunately losing the Crypt Trigger, taking 3 damage, and from that, loses the game. Before we continue, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize Bill as the first official player death on the channel since we returned to making videos. And to honor him, I'd like to first show you a picture of my dog because people on Twitter wanted to see my dog in every video, so maybe we'll make that a thing. And secondly, I just wanted to read you his final words and wishes. <clears throat> Subscribe to Casually Competitive on YouTube. Honestly, it's just, it's just beautiful. Anyway, the turn is then passed to Nate B. Nate B takes a damage from his Mana Vault and immediately goes to combat, swinging a 4-4 and a 2-2 at Nate. On attack, Verena triggers, Nate B draws two cards, gains two life, discards two cards, and then Nate L decides to block the 2-2 with Cranko. The 2-2 dies and the Goblin Sharpshooter trigger goes on the stack. Nate decides to, in response to that, tap Sharpshooter to target Adam's bird, and it then untaps from the trigger and Nate L retaps it to finish off Adam's bird. In his second main phase, Nate B casts a Lotus Petal, he then casts a Phyrexian Altar, and then plays a Polluted Delta as his land for turn, which he pays one life to crack for a Swamp. He then casts Relentless Dead, and sacrifices Relentless Dead to the Altar. When the creature dies, a Goblin Sharpshooter trigger goes on the stack, so Nate L pings Nate B's face with that damage. And then Nate B pays two to the Relentless Dead trigger to return Wayward Servant to the battlefield. He then sacrifices Lotus Petal to cast Gravecrawler, and, well, this is when things get interesting. So Nate B technically has a loop here. He can sacrifice Gravecrawler to the Phyrexian Altar to generate a mana, and then recast Gravecrawler with that mana from his graveyard, dealing a damage to the table with Wayward Servant. However, each of these deaths are going to trigger Goblin Sharpshooter. Now, Nate B can't die from the Sharpshooter because Wayward Servant heals him, but Wayward Servant can die. So, this is what ends up happening. Nate B casts Gravecrawler, deals one damage to the table, and heals one from Wayward Servant, and he then sacrifices it again to Phyrexian Altar. Now that triggers Goblin Sharpshooter, and Nate L decides to target Adam with that trigger. The reason for this is because, since Nate L has more health than Adam, he can effectively use Nate B's loop to take Adam out of the game, since Nate L is dead to Adam's attacks, so Nate L doesn't live through an Adam attack, so he needs Adam out of the game. So this loop happens a few times, where Gravecrawler is sacrificed, Goblin Sharpshooter deals a damage to Adam, Gravecrawler is recast, dealing a damage to both Nate L and Adam, and healing Nate B for one, and that continues to go on until Adam is out of the game. Over at this point, the loop can't continue, because because Nate L has enough health to kill Wayward Servant with his Goblin Sharpshooter. So all Nate B can do is continue to loop one more time, sacrificing Gravecrawler. Wayward Servant takes a damage from Goblin Sharpshooter. He then recasts Gravecrawler to deal one damage to Nate L and heal one life. But at this point, he's already attacked. He can't really do anything. So he has to pass the turn to Nate L. Now you may be wondering why Nate L was doing this because it looks like he's in an unwinnable situation anyway. However, there is a card he can draw in order to win this. Remember, he has Goblin Sharpshooter on the battlefield. He really only needs a Splinter Twin in order to go infinite and win the game. So, Nate L goes to his turn, untaps, draws a card for turn, and then just passes the turn to Nate B because the chances of drawing that card are like really, really low. So like, I don't know if you guys were like excited or thought it was gonna happen, but like statistically incredibly unlikely. But I guess there was a chance, which is why Nate L decided to play it that way. Uh, but he just passed the turn to Nate B. Nate B goes to combat, swings at him uh, and wins the game. Well, that about does it for our first video back. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it more than our last tribal video. And we hope you're excited that we're back. I mean, we're excited to be back. For me, it's nice to have something to do in my life that's not just spend every waking hour of my day on World of Warcraft. But anyway, we have a ton of content lined up for you over the next few days, so hopefully you're looking forward to that. If you're not already subscribed, feel free to do that so you're notified right when those go live. And if you want to watch the videos right now, head on over to casuallycompetitive.tv. 
and just sign up and watch them like right now. Like there's, you don't have to wait. They're already there ready for you to watch. But if you want to wait, they'll be uploaded in just a few days. Anyway, that's all we got for you for this video. I am Joseph. This is Casual Competitive. We will see you next time.